300 subscribers, you say. This is the stimulus! Hey guys, welcome back to the stimulus. I'm Steph S, and Twism is back, baby! So sit back, relax, and let me fill you in on what happened this week in STEM. Are you sick of Pluto news yet? Well, that's too bad because we have more of it. Last week, New Horizons started its year-long download of images. And the images from this week alone, we've been able to more than double the size of the planet's surface that we've been able to view so far. So what exactly is new that we're seeing? Well, first off, dunes! Lots and lots of dunes! And I know we have lots of dunes here on Earth, so what exactly makes this special? Well, Pluto's atmosphere is incredibly thin, so the fact that there are dunes that have formed means that either Pluto at one point had a thicker atmosphere or that there's a geological process happening on the surface that we don't understand yet. Mystery, suspense, excitement, science! We're also seeing more nitrogen ice flows on the surface, this time seeming to form from the mountainous regions and then flowing out onto the plains. Ooh. The new images also revealed lots of chaotically jumbled mountains like the ones that we see on Europa and networks of valleys carved out by all the stuff that blows across Pluto's surface. But the fun doesn't stop at the geology. We also found out this week that the hazes around Pluto actually have more layers than we initially anticipated. Additionally, these hazes also create a twilight effect, so when the sun is setting, they actually softly illuminate the night side of the planet. How cool is that? Pluto wasn't the only one getting some love this week from Lori. We also got back some new images of Charon, Pluto's largest moon. These images revealed a crazy geologic history, which have actually led to the formation of smooth, fractured plains, massive mountains, and heavily cratered regions. Side note, I hate you, I get it, there's a theme and there's rules, blah blah blah, but can we please, 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 please consider keeping some of the informal names on Karen? It's practically a geek's just dream world. Who doesn't love the name Vulcan Planum and Gallifrey Macula and even Vader Crater? I mean, come on, guys, it's so cool. Talk about generating public interest, yeah, let's just get all the geek boys on your side. Let's just leave in just one of these things, please. As of right now, the New Horizons spacecraft is 43 million miles beyond Pluto heading towards its next target in the Kuiper Belt. So keep your fingers crossed, knock on wood, whatever superstitions you have because this mission ain't over yet. Our next story of the week deals with a creature that is very much of this Earth, despite what mainstream media might be trying to get you to think. If you follow the Stimulus Facebook page, which if you don't, you should probably go like it, you know that this week I posted a story about octopuses being aliens, but they're not really, and the clickbaity title really bothered me, so I went and actually got a different source, but it's actually a really cool story, so I want to cover it. While they may bear a startling resemblance to, you know, face huggers, octopuses are not aliens. They're just really different from anything else on this planet. Clifton Ragsdale, an associate professor of neurobiology, organismal biology, and anatomy at the University of Chicago and a team of researchers have performed the first complete genome sequencing of an octopus, specifically the California two-spot octopus. As I said before, the genome sequencing yielded results that show that octopuses' genomes are very different from anything else found on the planet. So what exactly led to this super rare genome? Well, octopuses are cephalopods, much like squids, cuttlefish, and nautiluses. Cephalopods have been around a long time, over 500 million years. To put this in perspective, that's before plants even moved on land, so they've had plenty of time to evolve. The gene expansion appears to be tied to several specific gene families, especially ones that are tied to neuronal development. In order to fully sequence the genome, Ragsdale and his team sequenced each base pair and averages 60 times. The team estimates that the genome has 2.7 billion, with a B, base pairs with many long repeated sequences. The team identified more than 33,000 protein coding genes, which is way more than humans have. The most notable gene expansion appeared in the family of genes known as the protocoderins, which regulate neuronal development and short-range communication between neurons. The octopus's genome has 168 protocoderins, which is 10 times more than any other invertebrate and two times as many as mammals. The team hypothesizes that the protocoderins are imperative to the evolution of the cephalopod nervous system since their neurons lack myelin and it's dependent on those short-range communications between neurons. All in all, to summarize, octopuses are weird, y'all. Our next story that we deals with a species that's a little bit more like us. Well, actually, a lot more like us. This week, Wits University, in collaboration with the National Geographic Society and the South African Department of Science and Technology slash National Research Foundation, announced that humans are getting a new relative. Meet Homo naledi, the newest species in our genus. Despite being one of our most primitive relatives, Homo naledi actually demonstrates some startling ritualistic behavior. 
It appears that these guys actually purposely placed the bodies of their dead in caves in some sort of burial ritual, and it was this ritual that actually led to the discovery. Back in 2013, two cavers were exploring the Rising Star Cave near Johannesburg, South Africa, when they stumbled across a cavern full of fossils. They tipped off local researchers and, three years and two expeditions later, they have recovered over 1,550 fossil pieces from 15 different individuals, making this the single largest fossil hominid discovery on the continent of Africa. Lee Berger, a research professor at the university, led both expeditions, which were extremely difficult and extremely dangerous. The cavern in which the fossils was housed was tiny, so in order to retrieve them, Berger had to go out and hire a team of six excavation scientists, which met the requirements of small enough to fit into the cave. Fun fact, all six of these scientists were women. Yes, ten women! So how does Homo naledi compare to the rest of the genus? Well, their brains were about the size of an orange, they had slender bodies that stood on average about 5 feet tall, and they usually weighed about 100 pounds. Their teeth and skull features were similar to Homo habilis, one of our earliest known genus members. Their shoulders resembled apes' shoulder structure, but their fingers were curved, meaning that they could climb things and they likely had tool-using capability. They had long legs, which means that they were capable of walking long distances, and at the end of those legs are the features that is most similar to our own, their feet. Despite there having been two expeditions, there are still tons of fossils down in the cave to recover, so it'll be interesting to see what else we learn about our new family member. Hopefully nothing too weird. Thank goodness we have evolved so far beyond our ancestors that we can now line up outside of the store in the bitter cold to buy whatever the latest products are that Apple's rolling out. If you're like me and you have a life with responsibilities and stuff, and you didn't have a couple hours to spare to sit down and watch the Apple event this week, no worries, I got you covered. The first product that we're going to talk about is the Apple Watch, which is now coming out with even more colors such as rose gold, and now has fancy leather wrist straps from a company called Hermes, which apparently makes high-end watches? I don't know, I'm still not going to buy a smartwatch. The new watches will be equipped with Watch OS 2, which will allow for third-party integrations and messenger apps. The watches will be available starting September 16th for $349, so if you're into smart watches, like not me, and you have $350 laying around, go for it! Do your thing! Next up is the iPhone 6S and 6S Plus, which is also getting the new color of rose gold. Stop trying to make rose gold happen, Apple! It's never gonna happen! These phones are pretty much the same size as the older models, and they're supposedly more durable, which I'm taking to mean that if I put it in my back pocket without a case, it's not gonna bend? Is that correct? I kinda hope so. They also have the new A9 chip, which runs 70% faster for CPU tasks and 90% faster for graphic tasks than the older models. The cameras on the new phones will be equipped with a 12 megapixel EyeSight shooter. It'll have 50% more pixels, faster autofocus, and will allow for you to shoot video in 4K. The camera also comes with a feature called Live Photos, which basically allows you to create GIFs from your photos. Yes, I said GIF, and I will fight anybody to the death with my last breath. It is GIF, not GIF. GIF is peanut butter. You're wrong. I don't care who said it. It's GIF. The phones also have a new feature to where if you want to talk to Siri, you can just say, hey Siri, rather than having to hold down the button, like so. Hey Siri, I hate you. After all I've done for you. What have you done for me? Nothing. Oh, my hate for Siri runs deep. I love it when I ask her to call a family member and she starts telling me about Chinese food or something else that I had no interest in. I really hate Siri. It's probably just because I have a manly voice. It's probably, it. yeah. The phones will come standard with the new iOS 9, which will be available for all iOS devices starting September 16th. You can buy the 16GB 6S for $199 or the 16GB 6S Plus for $299. The phones themselves will be available on September 25th. Next up is the Apple TV with more Siri! Goody! Siri will search movies by titles and categories and she supposedly understands context a little bit better. So if you're watching a movie and you don't understand something, you can say, hey Siri, what did she say? And Siri will rewind the scene and play it back with subtitles, which is, okay, kind of cool. Siri can also provide movie suggestions and narrow down movies based on parameters such as actors in the movies. So now all you fangirls and fanboys can stalk your favorite actor through their entire career. Hooray! The new tvOS allows third-party developers to create apps for your big screen, and names such as Hulu, HBO, and Netflix have already signed on, so it sounded like this is going to work out pretty well for everybody. The Apple TV is also bringing a heavy emphasis to gaming with their new remote, also doubling as a game controller. I personally prefer my joysticks and my PlayStation controller in my hands. Thank you very much, but I appreciate your effort. Also, if we're going to emphasize gaming, can we please use a different demo than the freaking Frogger ripoff that is Crossy Road? Really, that's the best you could do? 
The Apple TV is also bringing on a new multiplayer feature, which will allow you to play with your friends that are playing games on their iOS devices. So, you know, that means it's time to kick all those Android-loving friends to the curb. They can't play with you anymore. You will also have the capability, if you're playing a game on your iOS device, to move it over to your TV. And if you're a sports fan, good news! You can stream live sporting events from your apps and then throw stats up next to the stream. So if you're a St. Louis Cardinals fan like me, you can watch them kick the crap out of whoever they're playing and then watch them slowly climb in their rankings. That's right, come at me! The Apple TV will be available in over 80 countries starting in October, and you can get the 32GB version for $149 or the 64GB version for $199. The final Apple product, which is about the only one that I really cared about, was the iPad Pro. The new iPad Pro sports a 12.9 inch screen with 5.6 million total pixels and a variable refresh rate. It's about 6.9 millimeters thick and weighs about 1.5 pounds. The new iPads are equipped with the A9X 64-bit chip, which is 1.8 times faster than the previous generation. The iPad Pro boasts 10 hours of battery life on a single charge, and now it magically has a smart keyboard and stylus. <gasps> Gasp! Oh, hey, what's up, Microsoft Surface? How are you? Fancy meeting you here. Now I'm going to break it down for you purely based on price. If you want to buy the 128GB iPad Pro, it'll set you back about $949, but that doesn't include the stylus or the smart keyboard. If you want to buy those, they're about $99 and $169 respectively. In comparison, if you want to buy the 128GB Microsoft Surface, that'll send you back about $999, but it does include the stylus. And if you want to get the keyboard, that's only about another $130. So that brings us to our question of the day. I was only mildly interested in the iPad Pro because I'm in the market for a tablet to help with my video editing, but was there anything that really sparked your interest? Let me know what and why down in the comments below. If you want to learn more about any of the stories that I covered in this week's episode, I will include links to my sources down below, along with links to all of my social media, so feel free to check that out in your free time. Also, don't forget t-shirts are on sale for another three weeks only, so if you want to look sciencey and stylish while really helping out the stimulus, I'll include a link to that in the description down below. Even if you can't afford to buy one, please share the link. It's really, really helpful. If you want to be entered for a chance to win a super awesome custom avatar or profile picture designed by Rob Cabrera of Creator Squirrel, the super talented individual that does all the artwork for the stimulus, then when you buy a shirt, screen cap your proof of purchase. I think there's a confirmation email with an ID number. Send that to me on Twitter or on the Facebook page, and I will automatically enter you into the random drawing that will happen maybe next week. I think we'll figure it out. I'll let you know throughout the week on Twitter. But we'll draw one name, and Rob will do an awesome drawing just for you for helping out the stimulus. So don't forget to do that. If you like this video and sciencey stuff is your thing, please feel free to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm putting out videos every week to talk about the latest and greatest in STEM news. Also, don't forget, if you find any really cool STEM news stories throughout the week, please feel free to send them to me on Twitter at stephes43 using the hashtag twistem, and I just might wind up in next week's episode. But with that, that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Stay well, stay awesome, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I will see you next time. I have to film this entire episode over again because all of my audio was hosed on the first day. So we're going old fashioned and micless since my mics are not working right now. Whatever. I didn't at all. Come on, I can do this. Neurobiology. Mm -hmm. Dance it out. You're mad, so dance it out. Mm -hmm. So angry. Okay. Clinton Ragsdale, an associate professor of neurobiology at Oregon. And I'm shooting this again because my audio was crap and I've never been more frustrated. Yes! But. in a family of genes called the protocadherins, which regulate what? What do they regulate? I don't know! I am an engineer, not this. Ah, but it's cool, so I'm gonna figure out how to remember it and tell you it. Ah! Which are responsible for neuron regulate? Uh, short range communication between neurons. Evans, you know this. You've already filmed it once today. Why can't you remember it? Since their neurons lack myelin and they are dependent on those short range 
short range, short range, you're on. Slide to the left, slide to the right. Nope, slide to the left. So running stand. Okay. And the South African Department of Science and Technology. I should be able to say science and technology. It's in my alma mater's name. I'm like a bird, only fly away. And maybe I do a window because I'm done right there. Did I just nail that? I just nailed that. We're gonna go with it. Nailed it! Yeah!